everyone. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Tove Whitmore. I'm the Vice President of Marketing here at Simba Technologies in Vancouver, British Columbia. I'll be the MC today. And uh, today we're going to talk about uh, machine learning. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to our webinar. Uh, I would also like to point out for uh, um, everyone who, who will be joining late, that doesn't make a lot of sense since we're at the beginning, but we will make a recording of this webinar available at Simba.com after the presentation. Uh, but I would like to welcome you all uh, to today's webinar, Faster Processing, Faster Insight, How to Use Machine Learning with Spark SQL Data, Tableau Analytics, and Simba ODDC Connectivity. We're going to talk about three things. Uh, we're going to talk about the new connectivity model. We're going to talk about data exploration with Spark 1.5. And we're going to show you some data visualization with Tableau Analytics. Uh, I'll be joined today by uh, Databricks Director of Client Solutions, Pat McDonough, who will show you what you can do with Spark 1.5. And then Product Manager from Tableau, Jeff Fang, will show you some great data visualization putting together uh, Spark data and uh, showing what you can do with the performance of Spark and the powerful BI solution of Tableau Analytics. So first, uh, I, I should point out that the marketing guy will speak the least today, perhaps mercifully. Uh, Simba, who are we? What are we doing here? Um, just very quickly, uh, Simba is in between the BI solution and the data itself. We're the connector. We build the drivers. So choose your metaphor. We're the bridge. We're the glue. We're the plumbing. We're the on-ramp to your big data. You need us if you need to connect your analysts from their BI solution to their data in some form or another. Uh, you may need a custom connector. We build an S we have an SDK environment for creating those, but we also license our driver and connectivity uh, technology to partners like Databricks and Tableau, uh, both of whom are uh, customers of ours. Uh, if you're using, for instance, Tableau for the Mac, you may already be familiar with our SQL Server ODBC driver, which is embedded in that. And Databricks licenses our Spark driver for their Databricks cloud. A couple of more fun facts. Uh, we know ODBC pretty well because we co-authored it uh, back in 1992 with Microsoft. Uh, no offense to Databricks, but we're not a new company. Uh, we've been around for 25 plus years. Uh, and before anybody emailed me, uh, I know that's the old Microsoft logo. That's what it looked like in 1992. And just because I have the opportunity, uh, we are hiring. And uh, if the projection screen wasn't covering my window, I'd be looking at this view right now. Uh, come to Canada and work for us. We'd love to talk with you. So context diagram and uh, a little more perspective on uh, where Simba fits into the, the broader big data ecosystem. We're in the middle there. Uh, we provide, uh, in this case, the ODBC interface and driver implementation connecting uh, the Tableau analytics solution to Databricks. Uh, along the way, we have a SQL connector uh, as part of our driver, and we map the SQL queries to Spark SQL and back again. And that can be very valuable if you are an enterprise with a strong, um, you are an enterprise with strong SQL expertise in your analyst uh, uh, workforce. Uh, you can leverage Spark by learning Spark SQL, but you can also get at Spark with your existing SQL query knowledge. And we take care of that translation process along the way. Uh, in addition, we are agnostic about uh, whether you're on-prem or in the cloud. We can support any model depending on how you want to do it. Okay, I think that's enough marketing for today. Let's take this into a more practical realm. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Pat McDonough, who is the Director of Client Solutions at Databricks, Solutions at Databricks, and can show you a little bit more about how Spark 1.5. All right. Pat? Thanks for Pat? Uh, Pat? Thanks for the intro. Um, I thanks for the intro, and uh, I'm excited to be on the webinar today. Uh, today, we, uh, as Toph mentioned, we wanted to give you a picture of kind of an end-to-end -end solution, um, you know, connecting or using Spark to process your big your big data uh, to build some machine learning models and then uh, serving them up to to Tableau, of course, with Simba sitting in the middle. So, uh, in case anyone's uh, unfamiliar with Databricks, uh, it's pretty uh, simple to sum up our company. We're the folks who created Spark and continue to to build the majority of features in the Spark project. Uh, our team originally came out of UC Berkeley's AMP Lab. Um, so the Spark project was one of the key uh, key pieces of the stack they were working on there. 
And ultimately, the team was focused on making big data simple. Uh, now, Spark's a big part of that, but also what we're doing at Databricks to, to really solve that, that equation end to end and make it so data scientists and data engineers can, can basically get to work without worrying about a whole bunch of infrastructure and use tooling that they really enjoy uh, to, to solve uh, sophisticated big data problems. For anyone unfamiliar with Spark, it's become the de facto big processing engine and platform um, for a lot of reasons. Many people very much enjoy using it. Uh, the Spark project consists of uh, the, the core project, which is a, a set of, of several APIs that, uh, that users can, can uh, take advantage of to, to process uh, data pipelines end to end. So that's reaching into several different types of data sources, um, you know, performing things like feature engineering and data preparation, uh, maybe feeding them into one of the built-in libraries. You can see some of those listed here. So that includes things like Spark Streaming. Uh, machine learning library for uh, for a bunch of uh, for several algorithms available out of the box. GraphX for graph processing, and then of course full SQL support both from a language perspective as far as the API, but also uh, with a uh, with an optimized uh, engine under the covers to make the processing of data even faster. Pardon me, I need to make an adjustment here. <clears throat> so uh, another key feature of Spark is that it it runs on, on many different infrastructure platforms. So um, Spark is, is very much compatible with Hadoop, but you don't have to use it with Hadoop or on top of Hadoop. Many people use Spark all by itself. Um, many people use it on, running on top of something like Mesos, uh, use it in the cloud, on-premise, et cetera. So it's very flexible uh, and can, can become kind of a one-stop shop for, for anyone looking for a set of tools to, to process their, their data, work with their big data, and of course, uh, you know, solve, solve uh, big data problems and, and build insights. Spark has become a, a very large ecosystem with uh, a number of uh, supporting technologies or, a number of, or, or support for a number of different technologies that you might need to, to use in, in, you know, in whatever, the, whatever the data processing is that you're doing. Uh, so, you know, we mentioned that in the previous slide that, the, that Spark can run on a number of different platforms. It supports a number of different environments in terms of using them, using their resources, running on those uh, cluster managers, etc. Um, Spark also has a, a number of, uh, of libraries and, and, uh, and tools for working with uh, different data sets and uh, accessing data from different types of systems. Uh, and that's become a, a kind of key advantage of Spark. So whatever the data is that you might be needing to, to process or, or bring into the system. Chances are Spark already has some sort of, of connection to that type of data. And also there's a number, a growing set of tools that, that might use Spark as the underlying engine. So you can see uh, several of them listed at the top there. Um, but of course, it's also worth noting that Spark out of the box provides a lot of friendly developer APIs, which might make it such that you don't necessarily need to use another third party tool. Uh, and so, so with all this said, Spark has become very popular for, for the reason of all this flexibility uh, that, that's available basically out of the box. So over the last couple of years, many organizations and many different uh, software vendors have, have chosen to, uh, to put Spark at the core of their um, big data systems. So you can see a number of, uh, of companies listed on the left, anything from uh, high-tech web companies to, uh, to traditional enterprises have uh, chosen Spark. and, and uh, you know, spoken at various uh, conferences, for example, the Spark Summit, where you can, I encourage you to go check out the website from, from those conferences. You can see a lot of uh, use case discussions of how exactly they're using Spark in their enterprise. And then, of course, there's a number of uh, vendors who, who have built Spark into their data, distribu their distributions or their data platforms. Um, so we partner with a number of the organizations that you see there. And, of course, at Databricks, we have our own uh, platform as a service available in the cloud. Uh, for running your Spark applications. So over the last uh, year, we've had a couple of major developments um, that have taken Spark beyond its early roots of, of simply you know, being based on uh, RDDs or uh, resilient distributed data sets. Um, and I'd like to kind of summarize some of those here. So first of all, um, in the last couple of uh, releases, we uh, focused a lot on a, on a new API called Data Frames. And we could talk about that in a bit in a, in a slide in a, in a few minutes, but uh, data frames are a, a very important addition to the Spark uh, um, platform. The, uh, the, any data scientist who's been using uh, maybe Python or R is very familiar with what a data frame is, basically a higher level abstraction that provides a lot of convenient APIs that are very useful when doing data science. Uh, it also becomes a, a great abstraction for us to 
hook into our uh, SQL optimization engine so we can optimize the processing of, of data. So one example of that would be um, as compared to what you might have seen from a performance perspective when using the, um, let's say, the nat native Python API prior to data frames, um, by using the Python data frame API, uh, you can take advantage of several underlying performance enhancements that are, again, uh, provided through, through our SQL optimization engine. And uh, the end result is that your, your processing of, of data um, through Python APIs is just as fast as choosing any other, uh, any other language, any other, pro any other programming language. Uh, another uh, important addition in the last uh, several months or several releases is uh, support for R, first class support for R. So uh, this is very exciting to a lot of the data scientists out there who use R on a day-to-day -day basis. So with this new support, people who are um, comfortable using the R programming language can start to, uh, to use the Spark APIs through, through R and take advantage of uh, distributed data processing through what's otherwise typically a single machine uh, experience. And then machine learning pipelines are uh, another important abstraction and API that we've added in recent releases. So this is a, uh, similar to something like Scikit-Learn where data scientists can uh, uh, define their entire data pipeline from, uh, from the point of you know, pulling data from, uh, let's say, a relational system or from uh, using Spark SQL to, to you know, uh, grab data in a, a distributed, optimized fashion, and then doing you know, data preparation, feature engineering, uh, maybe holding out uh, test data and training data, uh, running a few different uh, versions of, of, uh, of your model, depending on what parameters you want to use, and then ultimately uh, validating if the if the model is is accurate or not, and so you can define all those different steps uh, through the new machine learning pipelines API, and uh, a lot of folks are very excited about that. So those are some of the data science um, updates in the last couple releases. Uh, we also have a lot of of what we call data engineers. Um, some people might consider these folks to still be data scientists, but we consider it kind of a different different breed of engineer, and these are folks who are. Uh, are dealing with the large-scale uh, data pipelines which, which need to connect into different systems or maintain uh, curated data sets or whatever it might be and maybe ultimately feed into a, a model that a data scientist has built but a slightly different class of problems to solve and these folks are also very excited about Spark for some of the reasons I mentioned previously uh, mainly the fact that Spark has over the last year um, grown a, a large ecosystem of, of connectors, if you will, to different types of data sources, different data types, um, where they're fully compatible with Spark using the existing APIs. Uh, and connecting to those systems might be uh, done with, with several optimizations like predicate pushdown or partition pruning, things that make the data access very fast, but to the developer, the API feels very native and easy to use. And as you can see in this particular example, you might even use uh, a SQL flavor to uh, consider one of these data sources, a quote unquote table, and use your select statements to grab data in that way. So this is very exciting. It's become a very uh, important uh, integration API for many people to build their own connectors to the, uh, to the Spark ecosystem, and so developers can connect to their data, whatever it might be. Another important development is the uh, the Spark Packages um, uh, website and, and tooling. So basically, this is similar to any other uh, any other uh, toolkit that you're used to, where you can kind of easily grab a library that may not be part of the main distribution. Uh, in that same spirit, we added Spark Packages to the uh, Spark toolset and, and created this uh, website so that uh, any developer who's maybe not contributing to the mainline code can uh, create a library and and uh, make that available to developers fairly easily. And so this has become a great place for people to add uh, the, the data sources that I was just mentioning. So for example, you can see in that screenshot, um, you know, maybe you need to connect to Avro data. Well, it's, it's fairly easy to just grab the Spark Avro Spark package, uh, add that into your application, and then from that point forward, the developer can use their same familiar uh, data frame APIs to get access to that data. Same thing, as you can see there with Redshift. Um, another example of, of Spark packages would be connectors to uh, you know, Spark streaming type connectors or uh, machine learning algorithms. And this is a pretty key development for Spark because it allows uh, individual developers to build packages that are interesting to other people. And uh, in that way, those, those packages can kind of maintain their own life cycle and not be not adhere to the uh, Spark release life cycle and uh, can kind of grow on their own. And this is uh, you know one of the reasons why, for example, R has been a very successful project because they have a very large package ecosystem, which, which is very healthy. 
Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that Spark development moves very fast. I just mentioned several features, several very large features, which uh, most, for the most part only came in in the last, uh, let's say, six, seven months. And so because it moves fast, um, you know, this is one of the reasons people are very interested in it. Every single release, which comes out every three months, we're adding new features that, uh, that people are very interested in. But at the same time, of course, we're maintaining backwards compatibility so that we're not, you know, breaking applications. So as much as we possibly can, you know, we define which APIs are public and stable and encourage people to use those so that when they move from version to version, they're not seeing uh, major issues. Uh, and, and of course, uh, every single release, we want to do something very interesting. So, you know, whether it's for data scientists or data engineers, uh, we're always adding new, uh, new features, new algorithms. Uh, that are, are quite important to people. And uh, of course, this makes it such that everyone always is, is looking to great, grab the latest version. And uh, perhaps it's not always so easy because, uh, you know, releasing every three months is, is, uh, is, is pretty rapid. Um, but with that said, let's talk about some of the, uh, the most recent features of, of Spark 1.5. Um, actually, I'm going to go through about five features here, uh, some of which are not brand new as of 1.5, but they are, of course, in this latest release, and so hopefully these are exciting features to you, and then we'll encourage you to go check out the project. Uh, first of all, data frames. So I, I mentioned this a bit, but uh, anyone who's done some data science work with, uh, with R, with uh, maybe Pandas, within Python, um, should be familiar with what a data frame is. Basically, it's an abstraction that's kind of like a table. Um, so it has uh, columns with, you know, that have names, and then several operations that, that help you operate against that quote-unquote table. So things like selecting certain fields or maybe um, filling in null values or transforming specific fields or doing aggregations. All these operations are, of course, very useful for manipulating data. Um, by bringing these to Spark, we've uh, adopted the best practices from these other languages I mentioned. But of course, everything we do in Spark is, is distributed. And so we're taking what's typically a kind of single machine construct and we've made it uh, accessible in a, a distributed data platform. So that's very powerful and exciting to a lot of people, uh, especially folks who are already familiar with those APIs. Um, but of course it's also important to mention that all these, uh, these data frames, uh, like everything we've done in, in Spark SQL previously, are, uh, are completely operatable, uh, operable pardon me, from, uh, from the actual SQL language as well. So if for whatever reason you're not comfortable using these data frame APIs, you can just drop back to using uh, the actual SQL language. And so, you know, depending on what's the best fit for the given use case you're working on, pick the language that works best for you. So this has been a really exciting uh, development, like I mentioned, from a, the API is very kind of comfortable to a lot of people, but also because uh, by having developers use this API, it gives us the opportunity to do a lot of optimization under the cover. Essentially, uh, SQL uh, optimizations, which we were already doing for the Spark SQL project, now we can bring that to a wider set of use cases. And this is uh, this is key to um, you know performance, um, and also because uh, this this kind of this data frame uh, abstraction has become the the narrow waste for use in other parts of the project. So, uh, for example, the machine learning pipelines I spoke about previously, you know, you might as you are doing feature engineering, essentially add additional columns to a data frame and then ultimately feed that data frame into your algorithm. Uh, so data frames are very exciting. And then last note about data frames is that uh, they are uh, the, the kind of the, the end result of the data sources I, I spoke about previously. So uh, to, uh, to get access to any of those external systems, those external data sources or data types that we talked about, you'll, uh, you know, write a couple lines of code which know how to reach out to that system in an efficient way, and then the end result is, again, a data frame. So this is very uh, very much kind of the center of, of Spark at this point in time, and we're very excited about that development. Um, another uh, recent feature which is really important to, uh, to learn about is uh, uh, what we call Project Tungsten. And this is, in a lot of ways, a complete re-architecture of uh, the internals of Spark so that we can uh, manage memory directly, so no longer depending on the JVM for, for garbage collection, so off-heap memory management, um, and also uh, looking to take advantage of other very important capabilities for, uh, for faster performance such as code generation, uh, cache-aware computation, etc. So if you're, more, if you're interested in that type of thing, uh, I definitely encourage you to check out Josh Rosen's um, uh, YouTube clip at Spark Summit. You can see it listed here. Just go, uh, go uh, to YouTube and and search for Tungsten Spark, 
and he had an excellent presentation that makes a pretty complicated and sophisticated uh, underlying re-architecture very easy to digest. So go check that out there if you're if you're interested. But for the most part, the important thing to keep in mind is the end result will be um, much faster performance and uh, an even larger scale than what we've been doing previously. Another new feature, which is uh, just came out in Spark 1.5. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention Spark 1.5 just uh, just came out. Uh, was it yesterday or the day before? So uh, uh, this is a brand new release that we're talking about here. Uh, and one of these new features is uh, related to the Spark streaming package where uh, we can better handle back pressure. So of course back pressure happens when, let's say you have some sort of uh, no, uh, some sort of failure in the system, right? Maybe a particular node goes down or uh, for whatever reason the, uh, the processes that are ingesting data uh, slow down or maybe the, uh, maybe the amount, the rate of, of data picks up. Uh, and so that can be a, a, t a challenge to handle in a streaming system. And so we've added some new features to adjust to that type of scenario. Uh, another recent feature, which actually was not just part of 1.5, this came out in, I think, the 1.4 timeframe, uh, is window functions. And this is, you know, something that's near and dear to the heart of a lot of folks doing, uh, doing uh, advanced analytics. So let's look at this particular example. With this, uh, with this data set, we want to ask, you know, what's the difference between the revenue of each product and the revenue of the best-selling product in the same category? So, for example, if we look at here at the tablet category, how much different was the, the mini tablet compared to the, to the pro tablet? Because the pro is the, is the highest revenue product. And we can see the answer is 1,000. So with a data set like this, we want to uh, get the answers on the right there so that we, we already calculated manually that the answer to the second one was 1,000. You can see that same pattern holding true with the rest of the results. Uh, this is a hard problem. Uh, you know, this is easy to do in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet, but of course harder to do when you're dealing with, uh, with large-scale data. Uh, and window functions are very important for defining that type of, uh, of, of question and, and getting an answer. Um, so you know, how would we calculate that? Well, you would need something like window functions, and we've added those now in Spark. Um, so right here, this is the uh, this is the kind of I guess data frame version of how you might write a window function, where we um, use uh, you know partition by the category and uh, define a range, etc. Um, however, like like I mentioned in, in previous slides, note that you can always drop into into writing actually SQL to do the same thing. All right, uh, last feature I want to talk about is the machine learning pipelines. So I already talked uh, quite a bit about this, but you know, machine learning pipelines are a, a higher level of abstraction than what we were doing previously with MLlib. Uh, so this goes beyond just providing algorithms, but also providing all the APIs required to kind of define the pipeline uh, leading up to the steps of, of using an algorithm and building a model. And so you can see some code here where we're doing essentially um, a lot of feature transformation. And uh, as, of the, as of this release, um, we're happy to say that we've uh, got feature transformers basically on par with scikit-learn. So, all the kind of things you might need to do to uh, work with your data uh, ahead of ahead of uh, building a model, um, those those should be easy to do out of the box now. And of course, these APIs are also abstractions you might uh, use to write your own feature transformer if you need to. Uh, we're also continuing to add more of the algorithms from MLlib and, and new algorithms into the ML pipelines API. And uh, and of course, you might. Um, in, in case the, uh, the code is a little too confusing, just here's a visual representation of what this is doing, right? So this is basically defining all the different steps that are required uh, or, or that are uh, needed in this particular example up to the point where you uh, have uh, before you're, you're actually training your model. Um, this visualization, I might note, is also something that uh, we've made available in, in recent versions as well. So um, that stuff is all very exciting. And, uh, but as I mentioned previously, you know, one of the one of the challenges some people have with Spark is that uh, it's it's moved so fast that it can be kind of hard to to take advantage of these new features. And so let me talk a bit about how you might do that in in Databricks uh, by summarizing first of all what Databricks is. So we've talked a lot about Spark leading up to now, right? And Spark has several uh, advantages. You know, the fact that it's a unified platform, uh, it's very fast. Uh, we didn't talk too much about performance, but basically Spark holds the uh, the, uh, the gray sort benchmark record right now. Um, so, you know, there's no issues with scale or speed. Um, the, it has plenty of flexibility, which you might have noted from all the APIs I've discussed and all the different uh, systems you can integrate with, et cetera. And of course, because it has broad adoption, uh, you know, choosing Spark as your SDK, if you will, for writing applications is, uh, 
is a safe choice because it's supported from a wide variety of vendors and platforms. So that's all great, um, but at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's still a distributed system and distributed systems are inherently hard to use. So um, what we've done at Databricks is, as I mentioned at the top of the webinar, we focus on solving the end-to-end -end problem, which is to say if you really just want to get to work as a data scientist or data engineer, you want to build a data pipeline, uh, create a model, uh, do some data exploration or whatnot, uh, it's great that we've given you the tool set in Spark to do, to do that, to write the code, but actually getting to the point where you can write the code might be hard to do. So case in point, we were just talking about, you know, you might be imagining, hopefully we excited you, or hopefully I excited you up to this point, and you want to try Spark 1.5. So, you know, in your head, you're saying, hey, how exactly can I do that? And the truth is that's not always easy, right? There's not a uh, um, kind of, uh, there's a lot of infrastructure requirements that might get in the way. So at Databricks, we've uh, created a, a system that we believe solves a lot of those problems uh, by providing essentially zero management uh, clusters uh, by using, using the cloud. Um, so kind of push button provisioning of Spark clusters. Um, we've made an environment that is focused on notebooks so you can, uh, you can collaborate in real time with your colleagues. You can kind of define an end-to-end -end process, um, you know, share that notebook with others. And then, of course, it, we make it very easy to take that same notebook you might create and turn it into a production job. And at the end of the day, while we've solved a lot of problems in Databricks, um, we, have, we don't want to uh, pretend that we've solved all of them. And so we make this whole system uh, open and extensible, and this allows other people to integrate their platforms with Databricks. Of course, you'll see in a bit how Tableau might do that. Uh, so the end result is that you know we've got a lot of customers who are uh, enjoying quite a bit higher pr productivity. They can really just focus on on uh, writing the code that they want and you know performing the analytics and building data pipelines. Um, they can take whatever their work is, you know, whatever that research or experiment might might start at, start out as is very easy to turn into an actual production job. And then of course the end result is that this. This is uh, the essence of data democratization. So we're making this data um, easy to work with, but also very accessible to other people in the organization through collaboration and, and sharing. So with that said, why don't I dive into a quick demo? So this is the Databricks platform. And um, basically, as I mentioned previously, it's a web-based uh, uh, platform, which is a uh, you know hosted in the cloud. And it's all oriented, of course, around using Spark for data science and data engineering. And so the first step, of course, is to work with clusters. And we can see in this environment, there's already a few clusters uh, provisioned. Um, so we'll use the demo cluster here. It has you know, six nodes running in the cloud, and it's running Spark 1.4. Of course, it's very easy to go ahead and just create new clusters as well using this dialog. So um, as I previously mentioned, you know, while it may be hard otherwise to try to use the latest and greatest version of Spark, we're actually always providing the latest version in Databricks. In fact, we had the, uh, an experimental version of Spark 1.5 available as of three weeks ago or so. So if you're always in, ever interested in finding the latest features of Spark, come try, the, try them out in, in the Databricks platform. So I won't create a cluster right now, right at this moment. I'll just use one that already exists. Uh, and I'll open up this notebook, which is uh, set up for this particular demo. And this notebook is, is an example of kind of an end-to-end -end um, machine learning uh, use case where we're going to uh, explore some Salesforce data, uh, subsequently build a, a, a prediction model, and then uh, test it out and make it available to, uh, to other users. So you can see that a notebook, this particular notebook is a Scala notebook. Um, so a notebook in, in this particular example has some markdown documentation at the top. Um, but you'll, you'll see even though it's a Scala notebook, I can drop into SQL, which may be you know, familiar to most folks on this call, and start to explore the data that I need to work with here. So we're working from this table, new leads SFDC. We can you know, get a little bit of summary of the data itself, maybe do some simple visualizations which are built into the notebook that can show me a few things about it. So you know, what, what's the distribution of, of data across the different states? We can see it's heavily leaning towards California. And then we start to look into the uh, field we care about, the lead source, because we're going to build a predictive model based on uh, that, that can try to predict the, uh, the lead source based on the state. And we can see there's a pretty wide distribution of uh, lead sources here. And so what we want to do is prepare the data. So now we've dropped into code here. We start, of course, by just running a SQL statement and creating a data frame. And then with that data frame, we'll do our subsequent steps of uh, feature engineering and categorization and whatnot. Uh, so here we are starting to do some categorization. 
um, we're going to actually, uh, uh, pardon me, we're going to actually uh, uh, categorize the data in, in a, in, into less uh, less lead sources because uh, we we found that you know for whatever reason the data wasn't wasn't as clean as we would like. So we're going to reduce the the number of lead sources available. Uh, then we can uh, basically start to, to do the feature engineering required to, uh, to eventually build a model here. And um, at this point, we split the data into training and test data. We prepare the model, and then here we are at the point where we actually have our model. So we've just built the model with, uh, with this is using uh, MLlib uh, decision tree. Uh, here you can kind of inspect the uh, this decision tree model. Basically, decision trees are like a series of nested if if then statements. Um, the next steps would be to kind of test this out. So for example, I might actually uh, use my, my function here to take a look at how well this is performing with the state of, let's say, California. All of these cells are fully executable. So I can, um, you can see there that the end result is paper. So in this simple function here, I've actually, uh, uh, I actually am using the model to, to run my predictions. And that's pretty cool. We can actually use those functions in SQL queries uh, at a later point in time. But what we're going to do here is uh, basically build uh, a, a table that we can host for other systems. For example, in this particular case, we're going to build this table that will be used by Jeff, as I hand it to him in a second here, so that he can read from Tableau and take a look at what we actually predicted. And of course, here we can see kind of how well we're, our prediction is. This is kind of a simplistic example; it doesn't make a lot of sense. But in this particular case, the real the uh, the real lead source was digital, but it's predicting paper, right? Now, in this particular case, uh, the real lead source is paper, and it's actually predicting paper, so that's good. Um, so anyhow, uh, we can do a little bit of validation within our notebook here to see how well the uh, the performance is. So. Uh, in this particular case, if, let's let's take a look at the uh, the leads that have a paper lead source, and uh, we can use this visualization to say, okay, here's what the actual lead sources look like. Uh, let's compare that to the predicted, and we can see it roughly looks the same. Maybe it's a little more weighted towards California. So for paper leads, then it's not so bad. However, in this particular case, we can see if we try to use the digital leads, and we um, take a look at the actuals here. This is what it looks like. But then if we look at the prediction, well, our prediction is not doing so well. So we've got some work to do here. And we would, of course, continue to iterate on it. But at the end of the day, you can see how this notebook construct makes it very easy to share something that's pretty uh, pretty sophisticated with, uh, with anyone in your organization uh, to collaborate on these notebooks together and build out models which are uh, which, which you can subsequently use in, uh, in things like Tableau and whatnot, which Jeff will show you, uh, show you now. So that's it for my demo and my presentation. I'm going to go ahead and hand it to, uh, to Jeff to, to take it from here. Thanks, Pat. This Thanks, is Tofen. Pat. This is Tofen. Jeff, just before you get just started, here, I, wanted started to, here, I wanted to uh, thank you. Uh, you guys have to please submit them either via the time or the questions window in GoToWebinar. Thanks. Uh, Jeff, you there? I sure am. Great. Over to you. Thanks a lot, Tof, and thanks, Pat. So we're, we at Tableau are super excited about Spark, and we're proud to partner with Databricks and Simba in enabling connectivity between Tableau and Spark via Spark SQL. We're also uh, Spark certified by Databricks as of late last year. And so Spark SQL, as you know, is a powerful tool to enable you know, business analysts, and developers, and data scientists to mix and match SQL. Um, and uh, as well as for the speak Sparks APIs. Um, and Tableau plus Spark. Jeff, did we lose you there? Uh, uh, leveraging the Spark platform. Oh, can you guys still hear me? Yes, you're back on. Sorry, we lost you for a split second. Keep going. Okay, perfect. And so Tableau's mission since day one has to help people to see and understand their data. We help empower business users by allowing them to freely explore their data and focus on the questions of the data, like SQL, or the, or the process of answering the questions. And so at Tableau, we have four primary products. We have Tableau against Spark SQL today. Then we have a server, which is our tool that allows uh, users to collaborate with each other securely as well as uh, giving administrators the you know the, fe the enterprise features they like in terms of uh, you know 
uh, provisioning for you know, authentication, print privileges, and such. Then we have Tableau Online, and this is essentially the hosted version of Tableau Server. It's our cloud pay-as-you-go offering that enables organizations to get up and going who don't want to own the underlying infrastructure of Tableau Server. And lastly, we have Tableau Public, and this is our free offering. You can think of it as YouTube for data, and this enables data enthusiasts and journalists and anybody who wants to share data visualizations with other people uh, to be able to do so freely. A uh, quick overview about uh, the user interface for using Tableau, and, and I'll, I'm going to show you this in just a second here. And so when you open up Tableau and you connect to a data source, it'll automatically bring in all of the dimensions and measures, and it'll categorize them based on their particular data type. Uh, from there, it's, it's a simple drag and drop, uh, either dragging dimensions and measures onto the main canvas window, or you can drag it onto uh, one of the filters pages or the, or the shelves that we have. And uh, the next slide here. And just uh, just a few points about those uh, valid proposition for big data. Uh, first, big data platforms. So besides the Spark, we also connect to a number of Hadoop distributions as well as NoSQL databases. Uh, secondly, is we enable visual analytics without coding. So no longer get to write any more SQL statements. You can simply connect to your data and go. Um, the third is we have a hybrid data architecture, and what this means is we can connect to a data source uh, live, or we can create and extract that data and bring it into our in-memory data engine. We also uh, allow the capability to blend data between, between different data sources. So say as an analyst, if you are connected to Spark and you want to mix data together from somewhere like Salesforce or Oracle database, you can do so within our, our, our our platform. Um, fit is we've greatly invested in our, our query performance, uh, making the, awful, the uh, most speed to the user. And the last point is, you know, regardless of the data source you're connecting to, whether whether it's a dupe or whether it's a relational database or, or a web application, we provide a consistent interface to visualizing data. So that's it on the presentation, and why don't we get started? So what, what I'm showing here is Tableau Desktop, and this, this is version 9 of our product. And I've made a connection to this, uh, the, Spark seek, the Spark cluster that Databricks has created. Uh, so I'm going to start by selecting a schema. See the default is available. And the first data set I'm going to connect to is a data set called New Leads SFDC. Just give it a second here to queue up. And now what I'm going to do is, uh, before connecting to the data right away, I'm going to run some initial SQL. And this is just an additional statement to cache the data uh, in memory into a data frame. So it's a simple cache table, new leads, SFTC. And now once I update the data, I can see a preview of all of the, the, um, the schema as well as the samples of the data. So if I scroll down here and look and see what's available in our data set, um, there's one particular area that I think could be interesting, which is the status of the leads. Uh, but we see that there's like a, a delimiter between uh, the first part and the second part. And so what I'd like to do here is I'd like to actually uh, split this apart. So what I'm showing now is a, is a quick data prep function. Split it by the dash and I've split off all. And it'll go ahead and, and run that. And now I see that there's two additional columns. I'm just going to simply uh, rename uh, this one. I'm going to name it to lead status. And this one, let's call it, uh, has a lead been contacted. Okay, I'll just quick, hit a quick update, preview the data, and it looks pretty good. So uh, why don't I now jump over to our, our dashboard. 
And so this is just showing now, as, as I mentioned earlier, it splits into dependencies and measures based on the particular data type. Uh, we can start by showing like how many records are in this data set. So I just double click on number of records and I'll break it onto the canvas window. And we see there's about you know, 524 records. Okay, that, that looks good. And so let's say we're interested in seeing how this varies by a particular lead source. So I'll simply go down here, drag lead source onto the column shelf. And let's sort it from min to max and let's pivot it. Um, so we can see that the biggest source of leads were distribution monthly mailer, advertisements, and uh, retail trade shows. And I believe that this data uh, matched the same data that uh, Pat was showing earlier in, uh, in, in, the, in the workbook. Okay, and then one, one more thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, you know, let's, let's you know, let's, uh, we're interested to see whether the lead was contact. Not. I'm going to drag it simply onto the color shelf. And we see that majority of the leads have, have not been contacted yet. All right, great. So let's, uh, let's, let's, let's call this particular sheet leads. And let's open up another worksheet. Well, let's say we're interested in seeing where these leads are coming from. So now I do is I can drag number of records onto the row shelf. And there is a dimension field here called city. And so I'm just going to simply drag this over onto the columns and then click the map view. And also drag number of records onto color to give it some more depth here. And just boost up the size just a little bit. So you can see how easy it was to just quickly create a visualization based on you know, some questions that you have some data. Um, I'm just going to show one more thing here, which is let's if we're interested in pulling these in, these two dashboards to oh, sorry, these two worksheets together. I'm simply going to click new da new dashboard. I'm going to drag map into the field first, and then leads next. And remember, as um, for all of these visualizations, as I'm going, it's generating a live query uh, that's going directly to the Spark cluster. So now. Um, Just interact. I simply select the user and say for this sheet. And so now, if I state the other chart with you know where the leads are coming from, let's do the second there. So, real real quickly, I mean this is it's um, it's cool to see how you know by combining Tableau and Spark together. Uh, it allows any data analyst to be able to um, to be able to analyze the in insights of the data without having to write code. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on here, but maybe I'll just hit cancel. Uh, but yeah, so you, but you get the main point of the demo. Um, so in, in closing, um, you know, we're just uh, I just like to say that you know that Tableau plus Spark is a powerful combination to enable analysts to be able to analyze data without having to write code. Uh, we are really excited to partner with both Databricks and Simba in terms of enabling connectivity. And so I'm going to pass it back over to Tof uh, to close it up. Thanks, Jeff. I'm going to uh, flash back here to our lovely PowerPoint slideshow. Um, uh, appreciated hearing from you, Jeff. Appreciated hearing from you, Pat. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, and so I will uh, I'll share those now. I, I believe the first one is for you, Pat. Can you cover how the data was made available in the Spark notebook demo? Sure thing. Yeah, so um, there's a number of ways to ingest data with Spark and in, in Databricks. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we had a essentially an export from Salesforce that was placed into S3, and then we... Um, we just uh, imported it from there. So basically point to the to the uh, CSV file in S3 and then make it available as a quote unquote table in Databricks. Um, so that's a feature I didn't show you, but it's worth noting that, uh, that the table Jeff was accessing uh, is actually coming from that Databricks environment I, I showed you. And so all of those tables are basically uh, 
you know, Spark SQL tables. And in this particular case, that uh, table, which is really a, a kind of a misnomer because it's basically just a, a virtual mapping of a, of a, a CSV file in S3 uh, to Spark SQL so that Spark SQL knows how to process it and make it available as a, a data frame or, or table for subsequent queries. And of course, we pulled that into the notebook as, as the first step uh, by simply running queries against that table or calling data frame commands. Thanks, Pat. Uh, Jeff, this looks like a question for you. Um, how exactly does Tableau connect to Spark? Uh, is it Simba ODBC or is it through Hive or both? Jeff, you there? Huh. Well, hey, if we lost him, I'll, maybe I'll just jump on that one. This is Pat. Um, Go ahead, Pat. Yeah, I mean, Go ahead, Pat. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, uh, so in our Spark clusters in Databricks, we are uh, running the uh, the Spark SQL server, and uh, and so that gives you access to all of those tables I was talking about, as well as temp tables. And then uh, Tableau gets access to those through the Simba driver uh, that connects it into the Spark SQL server. That's correct. Sorry, guys, I was on mute earlier. Couldn't unmute myself. But uh, yeah, that, uh, essentially, by using the simple ODP, ODP driver and connecting to the Spark server, that enables the co overall connectivity. Um, so it's a, it's a beautiful solution of uh, three technology partners working together. Cool. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Pat. Um, uh, looks like we'll, uh, we'll do maybe one more here for you, Pat. Um, uh, question about Spark SQL. Is that the same SQL as HiveQL or ANSI SQL? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so Spark SQL is its own engine with its own uh, optimizer and its own uh, even as of recently we've even created our own you know uh, functions which are which all take advantage of code gen etc. So it's, it's completely its own engine however the dialect uh, that it, it understands is is Hive QL for the most part. Um, that is, uh, you know, so basically all of almost everything that that exists within Hive QL, uh, plus a few features and minus a few others. Cool. Thanks, Pat. Uh, not sure. I think this is another one for you, Pat. Can the Salesforce database data be queried using REST and directly persist as RDD slash DF into Databricks without taking to S3? Talking to S3, I think is what you got. Uh, yeah, so I mean the example we used is, is just the common, as I mentioned, um, you know, CSV in S3 type of integration. Uh, we do have um, some interesting, uh, or we, we know of some interesting new Spark packages, which are uh, uh, basically built to use the Salesforce APIs to query them directly. So yeah, there are some uh, Spark packages that can give you that. I mean, the important thing to note for us is as far as Spark is concerned, as long as there is a data source that creates a data frame, um, what happens under the covers is, is essentially an abstracted from us, and it all looks the same. So in, in this one case, yeah, a CSV in S3 is the way we ingest the data, but we could do this exact same notebook uh, if that if that table was actually driven by a, uh, a plug-in from a Spark package. And as I mentioned, there is a, a Spark package that's uh, been released, uh, or I think will be released uh, next week or so, or maybe last week, that does the very thing you're asking, which connects directly to Salesforce. Great. Thanks, Pat. Um, with that, I think I'd like to, well, let's, let's go ahead and wrap up today's webinar. I uh, want to be very clear to those of you on the call, if you joined late, we will be making a recording available as soon as possible. Uh, we weren't able to accommodate everyone who registered on the call today, and we'll make sure that all of them get access to the recording as well. Uh, thank you to Pat. Thank you to Jeff. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, to share this information with you guys and to really see how, uh, you know, how, to do, how to achieve best practices with machine learning with Databricks Spark SQL and Tableau Analytics and Simba ABC connectivity. With that, uh, I'll say goodbye and uh, look forward to having you all join us on our the next time we have a webinar like this. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.